So hey there fellow YouTubers, it's Frank Bush here again. So in the last video I did, if anybody's watched that, not many people have, but I built out my first prototype of the ultra-efficient 12-volt stove that I'm trying to, uh, to build. And it's really to have a stove that I can use out in the field that r uses really, really low amounts of power. And so, you know, super efficient, that kind of thing. So today, I plan on doing uh, the prototype 2.0, if you will, of as I've kind of advanced my theories on how this is going to come together. So I'll kind of walk through a few of the items. I'll just set this to the side now. But uh, I might take the gator clips off that later just for this, but we'll see as time moves forward. But uh, I'm going to kind of walk through some of the items that I'll be using in this build. This one's going to be far simpler than the last one. Um... The last one I think was an hour and 45 minutes or something. I, I'm really going to try to cut the time in this one. So, but I'll walk through, like I say, I'll walk through some of these items and kind of give you a detailed breakdown of the exact materials that I'm using. So the first thing I'll make comment about is this material here. This is a, a silica aerogel. It's an insulation that's hydrophobic. It's 10 millimeters thick and I got a sheet of nine by 14 of it. So I've already gone and cut out a six inch square piece. And just to kind of show you guys, hopefully, let me see here. Hopefully the camera picks that up. It's really a, a soft material that's kind of, you know, flimsy in that regard when it comes to being able to bend it and those types of things. It has no rigidity to it, but the insulative value of this is unmatched really compared to any other material that I could find on the planet that uh, the aerogel really is top shelf. So needless to say, I've got a six inch piece of that. I've got a piece of hardboard that came off of a larger section. I just cut off a six inch square piece of that as well. And uh, I've got um, a black piece of anonized uh, aluminum here and uh, so this is a six inch by six inch black uh, 0 0.025 inch uh, colored anonized aluminum sheet so you know for a uh, different measurement if you will it's a 22 gauge CNC plate that's in essence what this is so I wanted it because aluminum has got a high level of thermal conductivity so this one is really an insulative material this aerogel and this is really a conductive material so it transfers heat really well you know the amount of energy it takes to put into this to bring it up to a higher temperature is far far less energy than you would with the aerogel the aerogel is very difficult to actually i could turn around and hold this in my hand and put a blowtorch on this side and i'm not going to burn my hand to give you an idea how insulative this aerogel really is whereas the anodized aluminum if I held that in my hand, put a blowtorch on there, with a matter of seconds, I'd have, you know, third degree burns on my fingers. To give you an idea of kind of the different characteristics of the materials I'm using. So, and then what I have in here, I'll just pop this out. So what I have in here is a piece of uh, kale wool. So it's uh, a thermal insulation board. And it's an M grade rating for the people that want to know kind of the specifics of things. But it's it's like an insulative board, but it's it's rigid. It's not, you know, it's not flexible like the aerogel is. And really, I just wanted to have a bit more insulation that had some rigidity to it. So this is a, another six inch by six inch piece. I ordered all these items off eBay. They were like $15, $20 each. This whole build is going to be about $100, $150, just to give you an idea of kind of the cost of me doing this. So like I say, this is a six inch square and it's a quarter inch thick um, and it's an M grade uh, material. And really the M grade uh, products are produced um, for K-Wall high purity fibers. So it's really kind of a high grade version of this. But the thinking really is gonna be fairly simple. I'm gonna have this insulated board sitting on top of this hardboard that I have. I'm gonna have, and I've in essence cut them all to six inch square pieces so it'll all just kind of work together. I'm gonna have the hardboard sitting on there, the, the, the KO wool. I'm gonna put this aerogel down on top of those. And then I went into great detail about these before in my previous video, but I picked up some um, larger, slightly more powerful units. I think in the last video, I believe it was 168 watts peak power that that 
um, stove element was using and it was close but it wasn't quite enough power to do the job and I was losing a lot of heat through the aluminum construct that I had built it was really just a design flaw more than anything but I won't go into the full specs and details of these like I did in the previous video other than to say these ones here are slightly larger they're 50 milliliter uh, 50 millimeters by 28 and a half millimeters by five millimeters so you know roughly an inch uh, wide and two inches long instead of an inch square ones I had previously they still run off of 12 volt DC and then the power range that these go on is between 8 and 40 watts and they reach a temperature of 220 degrees Celsius so to give you an idea when I first turn on this stove the inrush of current is going to be you know uh, closer to 240 watts at peak power and then as the stove, co stove comes up to temperature I'm hoping that that number drops down to about 50 watts of power being used so we'll see if this is enough to do the job but in essence what I want to end up having is these six PTC thermistors if you will all kind of set out I'll just move this out of the way for a second as such now the way I built out the last build of my prototype I kind of really went through a thorough build of putting it all together so it wasn't easily detachable and removable I'm going to change gears in this video and make it that I can assemble this and disassemble it and take the parts off so if this prototype isn't enough to kind of cut the mustard if you will like it was the last one at least I'll be able to recover the parts with ease and those types of things but uh, I'll end up putting these PTC thermistors down onto the aerogel insulated material and then that black uh, anodized aluminum plate will end up putting right over top of all of that and it'll come together as kind of a single unit as such I can say hopefully the camera's picking that up okay where it's about a little more than an inch thick and uh, I'll have the wiring come out on the bottom side of this stove element my thinking really is going to be I'm going to put four bolts in on the corners to kind of clamp and bolt all of this together and then on the bottom side of the unit I've got some bus bars where I'm going to have two sets of bus bars that will sit on the bottom the bolts that are kind of bolting the stove element together will come out past that and then I'm just going to put on I've got a bunch of these number 10 yellow terminals as seen here and I'm going to uh, connect those all onto the PTC connections wire them up to the bus bars and then I'm going to go off from the bus bars off to the battery with some gator clips I'm not going to bother putting in the on off switch and that type of thing like I did in the last build like I say I, I kind of realized from that build that I want to have this that there's if I want to take this apart with ease and reuse any of the components that I can with ease I expect that this will work though because like I say I'm using 240 watts of power rather than the 186 that was being used before at peak power and uh, I'm not going to have the losses it, um, the efficiency losses like I did with the last design simply because I've increased the insulation that I'm using to be far far better where I'm not going to be losing all the heat from the backside if you will of the PTC the thermistors I won't be losing the, the ceramic heaters I won't be losing all the heat like I was in the first design in the first prototype there I won't be losing all the heat through the backside like it was in that design that I'm really hoping that this plate receives the the vast majority of the heat and the uh, efficiency of this entire unit is increased substantially because of that so I believe that because of the combination of switching up to slightly larger thermistors and uh, switching up my design to have more thermally <laughs> enhanced properties if you will that this should work as uh, expected when it comes to uh, having the ability to boil at least two cups of water within a you know a, a fairly rapid time so I'll cut the scene here I'll switch over and we'll start getting this build going okay so I just went and kind of grabbed a bit of materials so I can drill a few holes this is just a board that I set on to kind of drill into I'm just going to use a screwdriver to kind of put some set marks for where I want the uh, drill holes to go that looks pretty good 
build the same on there. Just really kind of prepping for the holes, if you will, for the drilling. That looks pretty kosher. Okay. So now when it comes to the bolts that I'll be putting through, I've got some uh, 3 16 4 inch length bolts that I'll be using. So I want a bit of um, space when it comes to these holes that I'll be setting in. Um, so when it comes to the size of them, I went with a 13 64 drill bit that I'll be using. It just gives me a bit of wiggle room. It just gives me a bit of wiggle room because I'm the heat that'll be going through this aluminum, I don't want that to transfer to these bolts. So one of the other things that I'll be using, this is a polytetrafluoroethylene um, threaded seal tape. So most commonly this is known as like plumber's tape, but it's made out of polytetrafluoroethylene and that's really a highly insulative material. So the thinking really is uh, in order to help alleviate some of the heat um, being lost um, from the aluminum plate, uh, plate through these bolts. I'm just going to uh, wrap some of the bolt right up near the head of it uh, with a little bit of uh, PTFE on the threading right where it's close to making contact with the aluminum plate to help kind of minimize the thermal transfer of heat um, from the plate through the bolt. Secondarily to that I also have um, some insulated washers if you will some neoprene bonded washers where they've kind of got that black material on the side you'll see these in the hardware store all over the place but um the neoprene can handle temperatures up to about 260 degrees celsius and this unit should only ever get up to about 220 so i'm not worried about that but um, i'll use these washers as well to kind of help insulate the bolts from the uh steel pl or the aluminum plate itself to really minimize the thermal loss that'd be happening within the system yeah so enough of the rant i'll just kind of carry on with doing things Not quite i'm really wanting to be ginger ginger with this stuff I definitely don't want to have it warp too much or any of that business so I'm not really applying a lot of pressure I'm just letting the bit do the work gradually there we go and as gently as possible there we go now on the back side there's kind of a protective plastic sheeting I'll take all that off because i'm really not overly worried these surfaces as we move through time and there's pots and pans and that type of stuff making contact with them they'll end up getting scuffed and scratched but either way i've got my plate now with the holes within reason really close to the corners I know I didn't do absolute measurements in that. Of, if you've watched previous videos of mine, I tend to be a bit of a savage that way. I'm just going to cut the camera angles. I'm going to switch gears and start walking through some of the other layers of this material using this aluminum plate as a guide for where the holes are going to be drilled in the next layers down, yeah? So let me just get rid of some of these metal shards and stuff so they don't end up on my carpet and all that business. Switch camera angles and then I'll come back. Okay, for the next step, I'm just going to go through that hard insulative board that I mentioned earlier. And I really want to make sure, I've kind of already positioned this, because the sizings aren't perfect. You know, when you order things online, they say 6 inch square, and then they show up, and it's not exactly perfect. But I've already lined this up about the best that I'm going to see it lined up. It all seems to be about as tight as it's going to be in the world I live in. So needless to say, I'm just going to set that down as such and i'm going to use the anodized aluminum holes that i've already drilled i'm just going to use those as my marker points put a good amount of weight on there make sure 
everything's just double checked that everything's good and solid at this point in time i definitely don't want to have any mistakes but uh i'm gonna put a good solid amount of weight on there and just use that as my pilot hole to go through and you definitely don't want to breathe this stuff in of this board isn't good for the lungs for sure but as you can see it went through easy enough it's not overly difficult to drill through this material but uh i definitely want to be cautious about not wanting to create too many of these little particles floating around in the air and that kind of stuff and i don't want to put a lot of pressure on this drill i want to just let the drill bit do the work You know, any fraying and stuff, I want to keep to, to a minimal amount as much as possible. But that's good. The holes seem to be lining up fairly well. Move on to the next piece. Okay. Seems to be going relatively smoothly. Make sure my holes are all still in good alignment. They are. Switch up to the last hole. There we go. All right. So hopefully the camera's picking this up, but we'll see here. So you can see good alignment where all the holes kind of clear through. It's always a good sign. And it still seems like it's in a good position from the backside's perspective. And like I say, this will all be bolted together. So even if there's a bit of fraying and stuff on it, it's okay. It'll end up holding everything regardless. But one way or the other, excellent. I've got that board out of the way. It looks like it came a little close on the corners, but such is life. It's all part of doing prototypes. So I'm going to cut angles again here, get rid of this fluff, because I definitely don't want to be breathing any of that business in. And uh, then I'll just do the same kind of thing where I'll drill the holes into this board. In fact, I might as well just do that now. There isn't really a substantial amount of dust here, so might as well just get on with it, right? And... Uh, this board lines up a little better because I cut it myself rather than just have it show up as a quote unquote six inch squared from eBay. There's one. And it slipped a little bit, so good that I caught that before it went south on me. Don't want that to happen. Okay. Like I say, this isn't going to be perfect for sure. If you followed me on lots of my other projects in the past, if I tend to be a kind of rapid, just let's get it done and check it out kind of business than I am about... Oh, is it perfect in every single way? But when it comes to the alignment of these holes and stuff, it'll be important for the bolts and that going through. So as long as they're squared, it'll be fine. And there we go. Yeah, that seems to be okay. Same kind of thing. Got good alignment on all the different holes. Excellent. That helps the cause. And I should be able to line that up with that and that on there. So like I say, I'll cut angles here, get rid of this fluff so I'm not breathing any of it in. And uh, cut back into different angles and move on to the next step. 
I don't have to do that with the aerogel because it's so soft and fluffy. I'll just drive the bolts through regardless one way or the other. And we'll find a way if I have to use a chopstick or something or in the end of a screwdriver just to pierce the holes through. It shouldn't be a big issue. But let me get rid of this. I'll cut back. Okay, so that kind of deals with this part for now. I'll just set these aside. Now I'm going to want to kind of walk through my thermistors, my PTC ceramic heaters. You can find these on eBay. They're only like eight, ten dollars each. They're they're relatively cheap items. But like I was saying earlier in the video, I want to build this all so that if I want to reuse any of these components later on, I can, you know, within reason as much as possible. Because when you're building out prototypes, you know, every every dollar costs, if you will. But um, I don't want to waste the material, so I'm going to build this all to be kind of easily repairable and detachable and all those types of things. So needless to say, I've got these little number 10 terminals. I think I pointed those out earlier in the video. Hopefully the camera's picking that up okay. And I've got these and they perfectly fit onto the bus bar. Now the bus bar is going to be attached, like I say, to the underside of this stove. Let me just pop this off. This is just to make sure that um, it helps protect it from any type of contacts being made. And uh, given that it'll be upside down on the unit, the thinking really will be of on the underside of this, like I say, I'll have these plates on there, but because I've got the four inch bolts that I'll be driving through to kind of lift this entire stove up, it'll be a good, hopefully, I don't know, see if I can catch it on camera in a decent angle. As you can see, it'll stand off the floor by a good three inches or so. So that should give me enough room underneath to have the wiring go and that type of thing without worrying about anything touching ground or any of that business. So either way, the main mission at this point in time, and I'll just do one on camera and then I'll do the rest off camera because there's no sense in walking through everything. I know I've done that in a few of my videos and it gets, you know, makes the videos longer and more tedious and those types of things. So I'm simply just gonna slide that uh, number 10 ring terminal onto the PTC thermistor. I just wanna see the tiniest amount sticking out the end. This is yellow on the uh, crimpers. There's a yellow. I simply put that in and squeeze. I wanna make sure that these contacts are on there really well. I mention that in every video, but one of the worst things that happens when you're going through time is you make a loose connection and these things come off and then you don't have a spare and you're having to run to the store just to get one, but you know, that kind of thing, right? But either way, that's on there now and it's on good and secure. It's not going anywhere. You do the same to the black side. Now, even though they've made these where it's red and black, you know, the, the natural um, thinking would be, oh, that's a negative and that's a positive. And uh, really, it's kind of handy that they're multicolored in that regard for the fact that I'm hooking them onto this bus bar and those types of things to make sure that I'm not accidentally connecting both wires to the same terminal connection and that kind of stuff. But in reality, these PTC thermistors, ceramic heaters, they... Um, They aren't polarity sensitive in that regard. They're a flexible unit in regards to, I could hook on, just really wanna make sure these are on solid. So that one's on solid. And as you can see, nothing to it. Just put on the two ring terminal connections and I'll walk through the rest of these. I'll do that all off camera just to save time. But the thinking with these things is, you know, they're not picky when it comes to, if I hook this up to the negative and this up to the positive, it works. If I hook this up to the positive and hook this up to the negative, it works. Because it's all about the resistance that's being created in these. In essence, these units are designed where, right when you first connect them to a battery, they'll take a large rush of current and they'll increase in temperature. When it gets up to 220 degrees Celsius, the resistance within these units increases exponentially as the temperature goes up. So what ends up happening is, they in essence, reach such a high resistance, they start shutting down the power to them. You can hook these up to AC or DC electricity 
And as long as the voltage is adequate and you know fits to the rating that these units are rated for, you're not going to have any issues with them. They're really flexible in that regard. And if I had a 110 volts version of this, I wouldn't have to you know, make the decision, am I going to go with AC or DC? Either one of them would work in that situation. I don't know of too many times that you're going to have high voltage DC happening in kind of home projects, but needless to say, it does occur. Those things happen. But you don't have to be overly picky about whether you're using AC or DC voltage, as long as the voltage range matches to what you're purchasing. The real key of these is, for me, I wanted 12 volt ones because I'm hooking to 12 volt batteries and I wanted to get the highest temperature ones of these I could. I'm looking for um, 270 degrees Celsius temperature ones. If, I, if these ones don't do the job in this prototype, there's a 270 degree um, Celsius version of these that I can get, but I'd have to switch up to uh, at least 110 volt. So I'd have to switch this entire construct over to be AC driven and hook it into my inverter and those types of things, which is all doable. But really, I'm trying to build this out where this will be running off 12 volt because I'm of the belief of, given the nature of the circuitry and stuff involved here, you know, there's concerns in the war going on with the uh, you know, the Eastern Europe and those types of things, we're no longer allowed to talk about, you know, those countries specific on YouTube because, you know, the level of censorship in this day and age is ridiculous. But needless to say, there's a risk of EMP, you know, and, and uh, other type of uh, weapons being used as we move forward in time. And I'm of the belief that these types of um, electronic components would be resistant um, to being destroyed from impacts of EMP and those types of things. So if I can keep this into 12 volt from my lens, if I can keep this into 12 volt, I know batteries uh, normally are fairly resistant to EMP when it comes to impact if they're not wired up to a big pile of circuits and everything else. So the likelihood after an EMP incident occurred would make it that you still had access to batteries, which all 12 volt based. And I believe that this would probably survive any type of EMP impact and would still be usable after the fact. So I see it as even in a worst case scenario, if things you know deteriorate in the world's security conditions, if you will, that I would still be able to use this as a functioning stove. And to me, that's the critical part. If I switched up to driving this off the 110 volt to reach the higher um, temperatures that these units can produce, I'm then um, moving into AC voltage where I'm having to rely on inverters and those types of things, which normally those would be impacted by EMP style events. And uh, so, so needless to say, I'm consciously trying to stay away from that by using the technology that I am. I'm not sticking to the lower voltage for no reason, if you will. Of <laughs> This is really designed to be kind of um, worst case scenario. After the grid falls, can I still cook a meal using a battery? Absolutely. So I'll stop with the rant though. I'll sw uh, switch over and just start putting these on. I'll do that all off camera. When I, <coughs> when I get those all wired up, I'll cut back for the next scenes, yeah? Okay, so I've hooked on the little ring connectors to all six of the uh, PTC ceramic heaters here. So I'll just kind of set those to the side for a second. Bring the stove top, if you will, back into play. Now, what I did off camera as well as just connect on these ring terminals, that arrow gel, I just took my screwdriver and set my metal plate on and poked holes through just so I'd already have the hole set in place. So the next step though, when it comes to this process is I'm gonna want to prep these bolts now because we're gonna look at starting to kind of bolt things together. So I'm gonna prep these bolts now by taking some of that polytetrafluoroethylene and like I say, just kind of wrapping these bolts right up near the head because that's where it's going to be feeding in. And I just want to put a good inch or so around that and just make sure that, yeah, that should cover it within reason. Maybe I'll go a little tiny bit lower. No harm in that. Come back up and give it a second coat. And really, this is just a thermal protection that's going to exist to help minimize the heat transfer between the bolt 
and the uh, stovetop element on the top, if you will. So then when it comes to the kind of order of the layout, I've got the hardboard is going to be sitting on the bottom. Then I've got that insulative uh, cable board. And then I'm going to put the aerogel on top. And this is where it's going to kind of get funky because, you know, it is just kind of freelance doing things. I haven't planned out every single little step of this, but the thinking really is going to be, I'm going to want to have these PTC thermistors and they're going to want to sit fairly evenly spaced out and that kind of thing on the top of here. Now, if I feel like after this video is done, if I feel like this has worked out really well and I want to kind of lock everything down, I've got some silicone um, adhesive that I would just um, use to help stabilize the position of these thermistors to their exact positions that I want them in. Right now I'm not going to do that because it was like I was saying earlier in the video of I want to kind of have flexibility when it comes to this where if I want to take this all apart and kind of do some modifications and other things and the reason why I kind of say that is thermistors aren't the only thing the PTC ceramic heating elements aren't the only thing I could potentially use in this construct um, I could look at using carbon fiber and then other things um, to be the heating element I'll show that in future videos but uh, but either way at this point in time these are the elements that I want to use as my primary um, heating coil if you will or heating element so they're gonna end up sitting on as such I'm just gonna go across the rest of these I'm just gonna straighten out this stuff so I won't show it all on camera but the thinking really is I'm gonna go across all four of those bolts and give it a good like I say about an inch and a half or so um, protective coating with the polytetrafluoroethylene the PTFE or as common terminology the uh, plumber's tape and just kind of set that on just to help with the installation so I'll go do that to the four bolts switch camera angles cut back and then I'll start bolting this unit together yeah okay so I've wrapped the uh, Teflon tape the polytetrafluoroethylene plumber's tape I wrapped that onto the bolts like I say just to give me a bit of insulation there and uh, I'll slide on the washers and I want it where the insulation for the washer is sitting against the um, aluminum plate so and then I'm gonna have the same sits on the underside so I'll just go through each one of these bolts and just slide on the insulative washer and I'm gonna do insulative washers on the top and on the bottom so just kind of quickly get those on and then like I say when it comes to the position of these within reason I've kind of evenly spaced them they're all you know equally spread out and that kind of thing it's not done perfectly in a prototype world it's good enough at this point though so my thinking really is now I'm going to take these bolts kind of squeeze this together take these bolts and just drive them right down through the different layers of the materials and once I get the first one lined up the rest will become easier to kind of go there we go first one's on I'm gonna hold that all together I can see I'm already getting a bit of those elements sliding but I'll just flip there I'll just put these in and then flip it over so it's all upside down oh one of the PTC elements came totally out of the unit which is unfortunate but such is life so we get the second bolt in I'll have to adjust those PTC elements in there but either way let's just get the body of this thing together to begin with so that'll be the thinking 
is really that these bolts will just all feed through as such. I'll flip this whole thing over now. So I'll cut the camera angles. I'll go and adjust these PTCs that slipped out back in so everything's evenly spaced and stuff. I know that's not going to be elegant camera work, but I'll evenly space those out as it was showing. And then on the back side, we'll end up just putting on the other neoprene washers and bolt it all down and clamp it so it locks. And like I say, if I feel like this produces well, I'll loosen these bolts back up and actually set these uh, PTC elements in place so that they can't slide around and stuff but I just don't want to commit to that at this point yeah so let me uh adjust these cut camera angles and come back when that's all straightened out okay sorry for the delay there like I said just you know the nature of doing things and so I kind of adjusted those PTC um, heating elements so that they're all kind of sitting in a better place they slid around a little bit when it came to things uh, such as life and I'm just going to slide on couple washers for the back side of these bolts now the thinking really is I'm simply just going to take the four nuts that I have and tighten those down now they'll help keep the PTCs from moving around as we move forward so needless to say, fairly dry process. I'm just gonna turn around and bolt these all down so that they're firmly locked. Everybody knows how nuts and bolts work, so I won't bother going through the full detail of that, but that's really the, the short of it, that they'll kind of be locked in place. And that'll firm up the position of the um, PTCs so they don't wiggle around too much. I won't tighten these down to an extreme level because I don't want to crush the aerogel that exists in there but i'll tighten them down enough that things aren't wiggling around too much yeah so i'll go and throw these other four bolts on flip it over and then we'll kind of move on to the next stage and you can see it as we go yeah okay so as you can see starting to come together looking more like a stovetop element if you will so i really just put this together with thumb strength i didn't use any tools to put these bolts together where i just literally kind of squeezed together the material on the side and just tighten it enough to hold it and that was just enough to kind of lock these ptc thermistors you can see them the white ends kind of poking out through the side here where it's all within reason you know i could probably slide that one a little bit yeah it's getting hard to slide but pretty well evenly set where I want them to be. They'd be good enough for the testing purposes that I'm wanting to achieve. And uh, they seem to be making good connection with the aluminum on the inside, which is exactly what I wanted. And they've got the solid insulation now on the back. As you can see, fairly narrow construct. I imagine if I built this out as a full kind of finished product that I want to do with the end of it, if you will, I would seal this into a better construct so everything was sealed and locked in and you know watertight and all that kind of stuff but as it goes for prototype testing I believe that I'm at a point where I should be able to adequately test this now and the simple reality now will be to flip it over I'm going to just use a bit of two-sided tape on the back of here to kind of use as temporary joinings if you will and I've got one positive side and like I say it's not really picky to which side is positive and negative but you know con for conventional you know convention sake i'll attach all the uh red leads up to the red bus bar and the black ones up to the black one feed off some wires to the batteries and this stove looks like it's pretty well ready to roll so as the next step that'll be kind of my next step in this journey will be like I say, just two side taping this on here so it's not permanent, but it's enough where it's going to hold it. And if I want to retrieve these and use them later, if this all doesn't work out the way I expect it to, then uh, I'll be able to recover those parts, yeah? And uh, if this does work out really well and everything else, then I'll switch it up and use silicone sealants and stuff to make this kind of more of a permanent connection and those types of things. All of that stuff is easy to modify as I go through time, though. And I really just wanted to be more um, cognizant, given the fact of the first prototype was close, but not quite to the performance I wanted I wanted to kind of build this design out which is fundamentally different I, I know from the first design but I think it'll be far more efficient 
but I do the one of the key kind of premises that I've had in this entire construct is uh, be able to easily replace parts or uh, disassemble the entire unit uh, as I move into prototype three hopefully it doesn't have to come to that hopefully this works well but let me just go and grab my two-sided tape and we'll move on to kind of binding these down and then just attaching them in yeah okay so I just went and grabbed my mounting tape you can find this at hardware stores and that kind of stuff it's a uh, two-sided tape really just used to kind of mount things so I've used these uh, this tape in previous projects so if you watch previous videos of mine in the past you'll have seen this being used I think I used it for when it came to um, hooking on my fuse block to the solar electric crate build that I did about a year ago I should do a follow-up of video on that as well of you know there's always all these ideas I get in my head but finding the time to do these things is always tricky at best but you just kind of pop off a piece of that but yeah the uh, two-sided tape is handy just to kind of make it where it'll hold it on solid enough for me to use in this project and stuff and potentially could hold it on for the long term if I needed it to but um, it's also got the capacity where if I want to peel this off and just use it you know this bus bar for other projects I can as well right so like I say I'll just stick that on there kind of press that down that's on there now it's got enough strength to hold it as you can see this two-sided tape is pretty decent in that regard just peel off another section for the other side Maybe about there there we go all right that on and really you just stick it on like a wood piece of tape and then you grab on the end and peel it off and there's a plastic protective cover that sits on there that kind of holds things and now i want to give them a little bit of space from each other just to make sure i got room for the connectors to all kind of go without issue all right so they're pretty well on there now like I say nothing complex in that regard and now the thinking really is i'm just going to pop off these little protective caps that kind of make sure that things don't ground and those types of things these are marine grade bus bars if you're kind of curious these bus bars can handle about 150 amps a piece and they're designed for 12 volt yeah so in this project i'm i'm only using close to about well what is it about um uh, 20 amps so i'm not overly concerned about you know having excessive amounts of amps or any of that business going through these bus bars they can easily handle the load that i'm putting on them i just like the uh design of them where they had these plastic sheath covers and that kind of stuff to ensure because it's on the bottom of things i just wanted to make sure that um there was some level of protection that existed when it came to um potentially if they accidentally touch ground or any of that business i you know want to avoid any of that reality as much as possible so needless to say i'll do just a single example here all i'm doing really and then i'll go and do the rest off camera yeah but all i'm really doing is turning around and saying okay connect the red leads from the ptc thermistors off to the bus bar and like i say the polarity isn't really a critical issue in this regard but it's good for me that these are red and black even though it's you know a secondary kind of issue it's good for me that these are red and black in the regards of uh i'll know that i'm not accidentally going to turn around and connect both leads up to the same bus block you know if you do that you wouldn't have power flow and your ptc element just wouldn't be working right so i'll try to get this one in on this side And these might actually get to be a little bit of a tight fit as I go, but that'll be my problem I'll deal with off camera. But either way, that's the thinking is I'm just going to want to turn around and connect all of the connections from the PTCs. There, see, it's on there fairly firm, not going anywhere. That one's not going anywhere. So I'll do the same kind of thing with all six of the PTCs, wire them all in and then I'll cut back, yeah? Okay, so I tried to spare you from the 20 minutes of unscrewing little tiny screws with bad eyes and <laughs> all that kind of stuff. And you can see it looks like kind of a 
an organized pile of a jumbled wired mess. And then that's because it is. If you've watched previous videos of mine, quite often you'll see piles of wire coming together and somehow magically working. It seems to be a common theme in my recent videos lately, but either way, needless to say, it's really simple though. I've turned around and taken all these PTCs, hooked all the positive to the positive, the negative to the negatives, and now the thinking really is that is now kind of ready to go. Like I said, when it comes to the placement of the PTCs underneath this aluminum bit, right now it's they're within reason in a good position. If I have to, I'll loosen this off a bit and adjust those and then silicone them down. That'll probably be the longer term reality. But uh, hopefully that kind of gives you an idea of, you can see all the wiring sits a couple inches up off of the ground, if you will, or the counter or whatever you're putting it on. So I'm not overly concerned in that regard. And then now the thinking will be, I didn't mention the wire thickness too much in, up to this point, but because we're working now in 12 volt and we're looking at the maximum potential amperage draw of this being closer to 20 amps, you know, uh, 240 watts worth of power, that's a significant amount of power when it comes to uh, running amps through wires. So in the last build, because they were less powerful, I managed to get away with using, I believe it was a 14 gauge wire I used in that, uh, you know, I can't be absolute on that, but needless to say, um, if you're wanting to do this kind of construct and you're working within this many amps, you've got to switch up to a higher gauge um, wire. So my thinking really is I've got some ring terminals here and some spade terminals and now the spade terminals i'm going to use to hook on to the end that feeds off to the battery because uh, the spade terminals work well with the uh, gator clips but i've got these type of number 10 ring terminals kind of hopefully camera gets that good justice they've got uh, good thick metal um, surface area and like i say passing 20 amps i know that the uh 10 gauge wire is going to be able to handle that level of amp. If I used a wire that was thinner than this running off to my batteries, I definitely run the risk of having that wire blow out and just melt from the high amperage level. So the thinking really though is there's bolts that sit on the ends here and I simply am going to bolt on my main lines that come off and go to the batteries. Oh. I'm gonna, in fact, I'll just set those in the center for now because I don't need that off immediately. But the thinking really is just these ring terminals are gonna end up connecting onto here and then the positive and negative are just gonna feed off. Then I'll do a half decent length of this number 10 wire. I'll probably end up taping it together so it stays grouped together. But it is a, a thicker wire. Be, be conscious of that if you plan on building this project out. You know, it's always good to know how many amps you're pushing through wires and that you're not running the risk of creating a fire or any of that business. You know, of if you're at all questioning those, there's charts that exist online of how many amps can you run through the different gauge wires and that is readily available and easily accessible. There's images that, you know, keep it simple. But uh, for this project specifically, I'll need to use number 10 wire. It's the uh, minimal safest level of wire. So I'll just snip this and get some lines ready and hook on these ring terminals. I won't bother showing that all on camera. I've shown that in previous videos, lots of fairly elementary of just clean back this wire to expose some of the metal these slide on and clamp down just as i did with these ring terminals nothing magical about it but uh i'll go off and do that off camera once i've got my wires together i'll cut back and kind of move to the next scenes yeah so off camera i just snipped a length of the uh, number 10 gauge for my black and my red wire taped it together a bit just to kind of keep the wire mess to a dull roar it's always a problem in my life but uh, needless to say i just attached some ring terminals onto both ends nothing complex there the thinking really now will be that i want to just simply attach the red to the red throw the washer on put the bolt on and i'll clamp that all down Like I say, nothing complex there. Just literally bolt them on. Make sure it's on there good and tight. I'll deal with the other side and connection and all that in a second. But I just uh, touch base 
I showed doing this in the previous video, but I've got these little gator clips. Now, hopefully I don't lose things in the carpet here, but I've got these little gator clips here now. And they can handle up to 25 amps, but they're kind of adjustable, removable. So they're handy in that regard. Of So I'm going to take the other end now of the... Uh, the red that I have, and on that ring terminal, just to make this a little more flexible, I'm gonna turn around and set that right in place as such, put my washer on, and now there's just a little screw, and it's, like I say, probably not doing this justice on the camera, but there's a little screw there, of course. My screwdriver's just out of range, and Really, I can just screw these ring terminals right onto these gator clips. And that way later on, if I want to use the ring terminals for something else and change and that kind of thing, it's easy enough for me to kind of pop those on and pop them off as I move through time. Just got to get that to actually find the hole. Just bear with me for a second. It's a little bit, fi uh, a little bit finicky. But the thinking really is there's just a little hole that the screw will screw into, locks on with the washer, and allows me to brace those ring terminals on without having to uh, I'll give this one more shot on camera, and if not, I'll have to finicky around with it off camera, but needless to say, normally it's fairly elementary. It's always when you're doing stuff on camera though, though right? That things go south. <laughs> yeah. I'll just pop that in. There we go. And these just all kind of lock down and in place. And they're really handy in that regard of if I want to kind of just do um, improv gator clips on the fly that have good connections and those types of things, I find these are good little units for that. If I wanted to hardwire this into a battery, which obviously in this situation I don't, um, but as you can see, I now have gator clips that can just strap onto this end, which I can clip onto the battery. If I wanted to keep these things hardwired in, I'd go with the ring terminals. But given that these are prototypal projects and those types of things, you know, these things can shift as you move through time. So I won't bother um, putting the gator clips on here because potentially I could use this wire for some other project if this doesn't work out down the road. But either way, I'll go and strap the gator clip onto this side as well, and I'll bolt this down. No sense in showing any of that on camera. I just wanted to show the example of these kind of um, you know removable gator clips I thought they're handy and kind of cool so I thought I'd kind of make sure I covered that in detail in the video but then we're pretty well ready to go uh, as soon as this is all kind of bolted down we'll look at the next scenes as uh, I'll show you kind of the finished product take a camera angle of that and that type of thing but then really the next um, step in this will be hooking it on the batteries and throwing a pot on there and seeing what happens yeah all right well I guess there's one more scene before things kind of go to the testing. We've got both the gator clips on there now for both leads. I managed to bolt that down. The last step now will just be taking these little plastic protective covers, popping them on there, and now they've got little bolts that kind of lock them in place. Fairly elementary. And everything's kind of locked in place. Like I say, when it came to the uh, connections of these bus bars, if I see that this performs really well, you know, I won't do it immediately, but after the video and everything else, of, I'll turn around and just remove that two-sided tape and replace it with silicone adhesive. And I'll do the same with those PTC thermistors, the, the heating elements, if you will. I'll do the same with those when it comes to, uh, you know, making sure everything's kind of locked down more and put some Loctite on the bolts and those types of things. But within reason, this bad boy is ready for testing. So like I say, I didn't put a switch or anything in, in this regard of it truly will be just more in the, when this thing's connected to the batteries, it's working. And when it's not connected to the batteries, it's off. So, and the gator clips will just ensure that that happens. So at this point in time, I'll stop and kind of camera angle bit and catch that for the YouTube thumbnail hopefully that uh, works out well for the thumbnail and uh, like I say it's pretty well lit and ready to go now gonna give it one last you know pan of the angles if you will 
Love, but I'm happy with it at this point in time. I think this is definitely at the point where we're ready for some testing. So as part of the next stage, I'll grab a pop with a lid and I'll grab exactly two cups of water straight from my fridge. So it's sitting at like five degrees Celsius. I don't know, that'd be roughly about but 40 degrees, 38, 40 degrees Fahrenheit. I can't, I can't do the conversion offhand, but it's uh, gonna be just a slightly above, you know, freezing, if you will, because it's coming out of the fridge, standard fridge temperature. I'll throw two cups of water in there. We'll turn these heating elements on and we'll see if it does and how fast it does bring those two cups to a boil, yeah? So I've got exactly two cups, well, 500 milliliters of water in there, straight out of the fridge. I measured it out, so I know it's exactly that. Just put the lid on there. And now when it comes to my power supply, I've shown this in uh, previous videos, this crate. I've got um, two 12 volt, 100 ampere hour batteries that are lithium iron phosphate connected together in um, parallel. And uh, I'll be using them as the power supply. If you've watched my previous videos when it came to running a microwave out of the back of the truck and that kind of thing. Um, you would have seen this battery set up in that video. But uh, I'm just going to end up hooking on now my power supply. So there's power being thrown off to the stove element now. And we'll see how long it takes. I've got a temperature gauge. I'll grab that. Two seconds. No. I'm assuming for the first few seconds that potentially we might see a bit of um, smoke and stuff come off of these thermistors. So that's already starting to get hot to the touch. Let's see if we can catch this on the camera. So it's already up to 68, 71, 73. Hopefully the camera is catching that. So the temperature is increasing fairly rapidly when it comes to these. It doesn't take long for those thermistors to come up to temperature. So the surface is already now hot enough where that would be at a boil. We're now getting above that. Yeah, I can smell a little bit of off-gassing. Normally when you first get these things up and running, um, there's oils and stuff from the factories that are on them that burn off. And uh, But as you can see, it's climbing steadily. I'll switch this over. I think this is the Fahrenheit Celsius gauge. So we're sitting at 287 Fahrenheit. I mean, that's in a matter of what, a minute? It's really rapid, the speed at which these things come up to speed, if you will. So, switch that back to Celsius. So it seems to be holding at a, I don't know, maybe not. Yeah, holding about 152. Oh, here we go, it's rising again. So either way, one way or the other, right now it is 7.08 on my clock. So, I'll just toss that on there. And, uh... I'll uh, come back at timed intervals and we'll see if I can successfully get this to come up to the point of a boil, yeah? Okay, so I started at a weird time of 7.08, but it's now 7.24. So it's been 15 minutes or so. Just pop the lid off. A little bit of steam coming off. I don't know if the camera's catching that. And it's already hot enough to the touch where it's hot to touch. But... So we're sitting at 66 degrees Celsius, somewhere in around that range. It's already two thirds of the way to a boil. And the uh, outside here is, you know, 140, 150. So that's always good. I'll just put the lid back on because, you know, I want to kind of keep things going, if you will. But that's at the 15 minute mark. And to show you how effective this insulation is, like I said, the surface of the aluminum here is you know 156 155 degrees celsius but as you can see i can put my hand against that aerogel a quarter inch away my hand's not burning feels a little tiny bit warm can touch the underside feels room temperature the level of insulation that that aerogel and uh, the insulative board give cause it that Almost the entirety of the heat is being directed up and into that aluminum, uh, anodized aluminum sitting on the surface. So this is definitely a marked improvement from my um, first prototype. And as you can hear, hopefully the camera's picking that up. It's getting close to a boil already. 
And like I say, we're now at, I guess it'd be the 17 minute mark. And this is two full cups of water that came out of the fridge ice cold. So I'll let this go for a couple more minutes. If I touch the point of a boil before I reach the half hour mark, I'll let you know, yeah? Okay, so it's 7.28 now. It's been 20 minutes. And uh, even if it hasn't come to a full boil, I'll make a few comments here um, to kind of discuss how efficient this thing truly really is. Now, right now, the surface temperature sitting somewhere around 150, 160 degrees Celsius. So talking about 330 Fahrenheit, 320, 330 Fahrenheit. And you can definitely hear the waters right at a simmer in that pot. But to give you an idea of how efficient this thing truly is, I mean, I've never seen anything like it on the market. Of The peak power that this thing will use is 240 watts. And that's really when it first turns on. The inrush of current, because the um, heating elements will be... Um, at their coldest temperature, they'll take the largest amount of amps right in the beginning. So it's gonna draw 20 amps through these lines. Like right now, these, these wires are room temperature. There's no warmth in them at all. I can feel all along here, there's a little bit of warmth in some of the PTCs, but that's really the heat from the thermistor traveling through the wire. It has nothing to do with the amps that are being consumed really. It's more to do with the how efficiently it's producing heat and the heat wanting to dissipate out of the zone. But to give you an idea of truly how efficient these things are, once they've come up to that peak temperature, which only takes them a minute or two to do, you then end up in a reality where this element is using about 48 watts worth of power. So, you know, we'll ballpark it to 50 watts worth of power. Of it's using very, very little energy at this point in time. It really is only for the first couple minutes that it's going to draw those 20 amps. And then it's going to drop down to, say, two or three amps. And I'm doing off, you know, two cups of water here. And significant amount of steam coming off that. Hopefully the camera can see that okay. Of We're not even at the halfway point, or the half hour point. And it's at 175 degrees Fahrenheit, so 79 degrees, 80 degrees, 81 degrees Celsius. So we're very, very close to having two cups of water at a full boil at the 20 minute mark. I'll cut back though. I'll let this go for until we reach 738, which I believe, let me just check my scratch sheet yeah 738 was the half hour mark so i'll cut back at uh, 738 and see if we've reached a full boil at that point in time yeah okay so it's 738 now so it's been a half an hour i'm pleased with the progress has been making so far so i'll just pop this off yeah we got lots of steam coming out I see some bubbles occurred there but kind of fogging up the glass hold on let me wipe the camera off Try to keep it out of the steam. So we're at 95 degrees Celsius, 96. So it was at a boil with the lid on, but it drops in temperature when you take the lid off because, you know, you're letting the heat out. But there you have it. Reached a boil within half an hour with this new setup. Like I say, if this used 100 watts at best, um, yeah, I can see bubbles simmering on the surface. Well, hopefully the camera's catching on. I know the lighting's getting low, but hopefully you can see the surface of the water. I'm trying to get it on a decent angle where you can see the water kind of moving about down there. But either way, this to me was a successful mission. Of So needless to say, I might come up with a slightly different pot. I'm using titanium, which isn't the most ideal for thermal conductivity. It's better to use copper or aluminum in that regard. But as it goes for having the ability to boil off two cups of water in a half an hour with this setup I'm I'm quite pleased like I say there's nothing on the market that I've seen that's even close to this level of efficiency to me this truly is a revolutionary new design of to have the capacity where I'm able to at peak um, use 240 watts worth of power to bring that water to a boil and, um, in this kind of construct where I can throw 
you know, pans, pots and pans and other things onto that surface and cook with it. That's a six inch square surface. So I can use a half decent sized pot or pan on that. And like I say, once it comes up to temperature, it drops down to only using about 50 watts. It really is a lean, efficient uh, uh, piece of equipment. And when it comes to EMP resistance and all those things, I've got fairly high confidence that even if there was an EMP event or solar flare event that would knock out a significant portion of the electric grid and, you know, components that are used within it, I don't think this unit would end up failing in that environment. I think it would be pretty resistant in that regard. So, one way or the other, you know, pop the lid off one more time. Yeah, hopefully you saw the plumes of steam coming off it and the bubbles boiling down in there. I've, like I say, I know the, the as soon as I take the lid off, if I don't get the angle right because the light as we're getting into the evening, the temperature drops and the bubbles just slow down. But one way or the other, you could successfully cook with this. And like I said, use very, very little power. At this point in time, this thing is realistically only using about 3 amps an hour, you know, off of my batteries. I could run this stove for what 30 hours at least off the battery stack that i have here before i'd even need to recharge love so either way i'll like i say i'll wrap the video up it's uh, easter and i gotta go get my kids and that kind of thing and i just had a window of time to kind of throw this together while they were over visiting their mother for the easter uh, uh celebrations and those types of things but if you enjoy that uh, this type of content please like share and subscribe and thanks for watching yeah cheers